I think the advertisements are like a wrestling match between the perceived need to define race and saying a black slave, a Negro slave, and then the reality that just defied these strict definitions. They're looking for a runaway black slave and they're described as having blue eyes, white skin, and blonde hair. They simultaneously support these existing racial ideologies of, of Negro and white or black and white and also disrupted them. It's almost like a game of tug of war with human lives at stake. Imagine it's the year 1731 in the colony of South Carolina and a man named Gideon Gibson has just arrived with his family and they are the talk of the town. Everyone is gossiping about them, um, kind of trying to figure out what is going on. And the story is that Gibson is a free black man married to a white woman. Scandalous? Absolutely. But when the government looks into the matter, it declares that the Gibsons are, quote, not Negroes or slaves, but free people. How about that? This single family seemed to unravel a complex tapestry of racial identity that would later become a cornerstone of American society. You see, Gideon Gibson was no regular free white. He was a walking paradox. He was a light-skinned black man with African ancestors, yet by 1768, an investigation declared that he had, quote, escaped the penalties of Negro law by producing, upon comparison, more red and white in his face than could be discovered in half of the descendants of the House of the Assembly. So what's going on here? Basically, he made a comparison between how he looked and how a lot of these other Anglo-Saxon looked, and... They said, hey, like he actually looks more pink than we do. So uh, let's fast forward, though, before we answer that question. Let's fast forward now to the year 1845. It's another intriguing case. This is an enslaved woman named Fanny, and she escapes her Alabama slave owner. She's described in these advertisements, and um, we're going to talk a little bit about these in this video. Basically, there were these like ad, the advertising runaway slaves, and they would give a description of the person and information about them. And so we have one on Fanny. And so she's described in her, in her runaway slave poster as, quote, as white as most white women with straight light hair and blue eyes. He says that she can pass for white. She's practically indistinguishable physically from a white woman. And yet she's considered black and she's enslaved. So what separates her from white women? As Mark Twain puts it, quote, a fiction of law and custom. So there was another one from the Virginia Gazette, September 17th, 1770. And it narrates ambiguity about how much control a slave has in manipulating their class and, and, their, and their race. And this is how the ad goes, quote, run away from the subscriber near Fredericksburg, a light mulatto man, and in parentheses, who may easily pass for a white man named Jack, though very probably he may change his name to John Wilkson, about five feet six or seven inches. What does this mean saying that he may easily pass for white? You know, and there's, again, there's this discourse too of changing names in order to pass. There are lots of these, and I, I started digging into these a little bit. Here's another one. This is from a 12-year-old who ran away uh, from Columbus, Georgia's tri-weekly inquirer, uh, March 14th, 1857, it says, quote, I will pay $25 for the apprehension of a small Negro boy named Walter. So saying Negro, so just, you know, I think that paints a certain picture of what you expect this person to look like. Very bright mulatto, small features, gray eyes. The boy will no doubt endeavor to pass for a white boy. This is a categorical crisis here because we have we have folks who are being considered a in the words of the masters a black slave or a negro slave but there's the concern from the masters that they're going to pass for white and change their identity and be free and we have to stop and ask ourselves well, what does it mean for them to pass for white if they're looking as white as anyone who's considered white at the time what does that mean and there are lots of examples of this i mean just read a couple more lines from some other ones talking about this this idea of these enslaved people passing for white this one's from 1860 20 dollar reward i will pay the above reward for the apprehension of martha and celia who absconded last night martha is a mulatto woman about 30 years old orange color straight hair walks a little lame 
Celia, her daughter, is about 11 years old. A bright mulatto can pass for white. Uh, here's another one. February 24th, 1810. Jack is so light a mulatto that he might pass for a white lad unless particularly noticed. You may notice something about the language of these these advertisements. They're kind of vague. When the masters say that their slaves might pass, may pass, would pass, can pass for white. But these ads also raise questions about the scrutiny involved in identifying race then and now. So when they talked about James who said he could pass for white unless there was like close examination, what What's the close examination? But the ambiguity of these ads, sometimes unintentional, and I think sometimes by design, I think leaves us asking more questions than they answer because each ad is like a mini drama, um, a narrative of disappearance and maybe even transformation. It questions the racial order of the time. And let's be honest, if these masters recognize that their slaves could pass for white, what does that say about these rigid racial categories at the time? Historians often argue about this concept of racial uh, passing. Pretending to be of a different race than one's own is usually what that means. And they argue that it became widespread only in the late 19th and 20th centuries. But these ads, along with, there's so many, there are so many of these, reveal that passing has a far longer and more convoluted history than we've been led to believe. This ability to pass was obviously a survival tactic, um, sometimes a ticket to upward mobility, and always an unsettling mirror reflecting America's complex racial dynamics. Well, these ads were walking contradictions. They simultaneously support these existing racial ideologies of, of Negro and white or black and white, and also disrupted them. It's almost like a game of tug of war with human lives at stake. They question the very essence of racial identity. When I read them, I feel like I have to ask, well, what does it mean to be white? What does it mean to be black? And I think the contradictions of, of someone fitting into both categories posed a threat to this idea of racial purity. Those who could pass as white, whether or not you believe they were actually passing or whether they truly just were white at that point, they represented a paradox that the one drop rule could not easily resolve. They were living challenges to an ideology that insisted that one drop of black blood would make someone black despite their appearance. I feel like that is the part that is so surprising to me. I, I think the constructs and the boxes are stupid no, no matter what, but I think that that demanding we follow this rigid categorization of people in spite of what's seen in front of you is like, what's going on here? I think the advertisements are like a wrestling match between the perceived need to define race and saying a black slave, a Negro slave, and then the reality that just defied these strict definitions. They're looking for their runaway black slave and they're described as having blue eyes, white skin, and blonde hair. Well, what does that mean? I think it tells us that these legal and social ideas of ethnicity and race have always been a moving target. Now, I'm not saying that race doesn't exist. I'm not saying that different ethnic groups don't exist, but I don't think that they're as compartmentalized as folks want them to be. The narrative around this is always changing. The lines are always being redrawn. And I think the plot thickens as we move into the legal arena. I mean, we've talked about this before, um, but there's actually an interesting case from 1843. It was Lane versus Baker. It was a little gem from the Ohio State Supreme Court history that's worth discussing. And it was actually one of the earliest flirtations with what would become the one drop rule. So the defense attorney, his name was William Ellsbury. He tried to make an argument that white should refer exclusively to the pure white race. But the judge, C.J. Lane, didn't see it that way. And he actually permitted a boy who had, quote, a blend of Negro, Indian, and white blood to attend school with white kids without committing to labeling the boy as white, Indian, or black, which was a curveball. But if you fast forward to 1853, Virginia, the state legislator debated a proposal to label anyone with a trace of Negro blood as black. And a similar notion cropped up in Louisiana, 1857, which aimed at preventing marriages that were tainted, tainted by African blood. Arkansas took its own stab at defining mulatto that same year. And by 1863, um, Indiana nearly passed a law that would have defined blackness as possessing 
any Negro blood, and it failed by just two votes. I find it really interesting because like this woman, Fanny, would have been considered Negro or Black or colored on a census record of the time most likely, especially if she was still enslaved. Um, but passing her on the street, it doesn't sound like that's how she would have been seen. So what does that mean? So I'd love your thoughts on this. And if you like this video, you may be interested in my family's own story of passing for white uh, that I'll link to here.